there's a lot of talk about hustle. And a lot of people are out there crushing it yeah. and doing great work. And good for them. Um, and yet, I can't help but feel a little bit of this, you know, you know, the acronym FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. And also the tendency or temptation for comparisons. You know, we live in this Instagram world where we're, you know, looking at uh, the highlights of sure. highlight reels of other people's lives. And they're doing, they seem to be doing it better, faster, stronger. Um, can you talk about the hustle? Can you talk about sure. so there's FOMO? Yeah. Two topics there. Yeah. Quick audience poll. Who here likes to be hustled? <laughs> no one raised their hand. Human beings do not like to be hustled. Because what it means, the semantics matter, what it means to be hustled is that someone's getting something from you that you'd rather they weren't getting. Yeah. That's the opposite of this idea from Cat Hoke of a generous hustle. A generous hustle is when you show up with generosity to do something for the other person with no end in sight for you. Almost all of us like a generous hustle. Almost all of us want someone to coach us, encourage us, open the door for us, take us to where we need to go. So I'm a huge fan of the persistent, generous hustle. I have a real problem with people who are following some dummies playbook they send you an email saying, what's your favorite color? And then you write back, and then the next thing they say, will you be my mentor? And then, right? Like, there's this method, which probably came from the, the pickup community years ago, and the, the idea that we could manipulate somebody else to help us get what we want, it doesn't have a place. It didn't have a place before. It doesn't have a place going forward because it doesn't scale. It doesn't build trust. It's not who we want to become. So my encouragement to people is, Work even harder than you thought you could work, but work on metrics that matter. And the metric that I think matters the most is trust. Who would miss you if you were gone? Who's expecting something from you that you can deliver? Who trusts you? And we get that way by being generous. So to pivot into your second question, the essential thing to understand about social media, as well as cable TV, is you are not the customer. You are the product. You are the product because if they can get you in a certain mental state, you will use it more. And if that mental state involves shame and inadequacy, you will be more likely to not only use it more, but to engage with the things that are being sold to you. Yeah. So the metrics that are exposed, the makeup virtual and real that is shown to make everyone else's life look better, is designed to make you feel shamed and inadequate. And it is up to you if you want to play that game or not. But the people who play that game don't win that game. They just get to play the game and be sad all the time. <laughs> and we know this. We know that the more you use certain kinds of social networks in certain ways, the sadder you get. Yeah. And all you got to do is look at 50 years of Hollywood to see the corrosive effects of that. Because between the Academy Awards and the makeup artists and the who has a bigger house in Beverly Hills and everything else, none of those people are happier than they were yesterday. Yeah. Right? And so if you're going to be in this world, accept that you're the product not the customer, and use it for your own benefit and the benefit of the people you care about, not because some algorithm decided you would make them a profit. How do we avoid comparisons then, you know, with our coworkers or our friends or... Well, so status goes all the way back as far as we can measure. My dog gets along with almost every other dog, except for Truman across the street. Baxter hates Truman. And it, it, we love the family across the street. They got two little kids, and Baxter attacked Truman. Wait, this is something you know I don't... So you have a dog? I do have a dog. What kind of dog is it? He's a mutt from Puerto Rico. Okay, so you have one dog? One at a time. Okay. Well, we have two. We have two. We just rescued two new puppies. That's great. It's equal parts joy and pain right now. I understand. Is that what they're called? Joy and pain? Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've, this is our third sort of third pound dog in 20 years, mm -hmm. and um, Baxter is a great dog. But Baxter hates Truman. And the reason that Baxter hates Truman is because they're almost exactly the same size. So there's not enough, you know, no there's one too many knows, sheriffs in the No town. one knows who the alpha is. So the dog is confused. The, well, the dog has to settle scores, right? And like, watch any John Wayne movie. Here we are in, you know, Newport. Watch any John Wayne movie. Yeah. He doesn't, John Wayne doesn't hassle people. He's clearly better than and clearly worse than. Yeah. 
It's only when there's that status problem yeah. that it occurs. Uh, I think the line is, this town isn't big, big enough, enough for, for the both of us. Yeah. Exactly. So that's Baxter and Truman's problem, too. So it goes all the way down to pound dogs to humans. So it's not going to go away, just like our fear is not going to go away. The question is, what are you going to do with it? If the person got the promotion that they didn't deserve, or has a car bigger than yours, or gets paid to do work that would embarrass you, you see it, you, will, you cannot help but see it. Then what are you going to do with it? What story will you tell yourself about it to decide? So there's a bunch of things I stopped keeping track of a few years ago. I don't read any of my reviews. It's not easy to do, but I don't, none of them, because I'm never going to write that book again. So how is their review going to help me? Because I'm never going to write that book again, yeah. right? <laughs> and then the other thing is, I don't pay attention to how my peers are doing. They, they all sell more books than me. Fine, congratulations. Their YouTube videos, more than mine. Fantastic, because it means someone learned something. And if I don't want to have that race with you, I can enjoy my day more. So many thoughts. Um, I'll try and harness them. Uh, you mentioned you won't write that book again, but if you were to uh, update one of your collections, what would be the book that you would update you know, for 2018 heading into 2020, and, and what do you think's missing from it? Well, I'm thinking hard because I've never caused myself to think about this. I've had, you know, the publisher says, it's the 10th anniversary of this, will you please write an updated edition? And my take has been, well, then I would have to write an update every week because it keeps changing. So why don't I just encase it in amber and say, in this moment, this is what I thought about the world. And I'm not, we, Kurt, you know, Kurt Vonnegut could write circles around me, but he didn't rewrite his books either. It's okay. like, that's what happened. Um, I feel really badly about the way I marketed All Marketers Are Liars because I think it's a profound piece of work that people didn't get because the cover was terrible and the title was bad. My fault, completely. But you changed and updated the, t the title, right? Yeah, but it wasn't enough and yeah. first impressions last a really long time. Yeah. I wrote a book called Survival Is Not Enough that took more time than any other book but Lynchpin. I wrote 200 pages that I had to delete toward the end. Charles Darwin wrote the foreword, which wasn't easy because he's dead. And <laughs> I think... Congratulations. That, yeah. No copyright claim, though, so I was fine. Uh, I think there's a lot of lesson in that book, but it was 2001 and the world was a really different place then. So I haven't read it in a long time. It would be interesting to explore that, but it was more academic than I think most people want to read. Okay, so then let's go back to the dog dilemma. Okay. And let's extrapolate that or maybe make a metaphor out of it. If I'm that person, what's your dog's name again? Baxter. And Baxter doesn't get along with? Truman. Truman. I found out that Baxter was named after the dog from Anchorman, which em embarrasses me. <laughs> so just, you wanted personal detail? Here we go. Yeah. Um, Baxter has one paw that's a different color than the other one. And it's his right paw. I think he's a little self-conscious about it. So I, want, I wanted his name to be Lefty, so everyone would look at his left paw and not notice that his right paw is a different color. But Lefty, eh, it didn't sound like it. So I decided it would be Lenin, right? Because then I could get like a whole geopolitical thing going on, L-E-N-I-N. -N. Um, but the problem is some people would think I was naming him after John Lennon. So then I went with Trotsky, because Trotsky was perfect. I got overruled. His name is Baxter. So what if I'm Baxter, yeah. and I work with a Truman, right? There's not enough. Right. Uh, what do I do? How, you know, how do I, I mean, I've got this job. I love working for that company. True but, story. Yeah. Ready? Lawyers care a lot about status in general, because law is all this, you know, we're going to have a fight in court. One of us is going to win. Two associates, one's a friend of mine, uh, same start date. Five years into it, it's time for them to stop sharing an office. So there's two new offices. One office is a foot bigger than the other one. Who gets the office that's a foot bigger? How do you figure it out, right? Well, if you're going to do Rochambeau or something, then it's a game of luck and there's going to be hard feelings. So my friend said, 
to the other associate, you take it. Take the bigger office. Because I'm not keeping track of that. And it changed so much about their dynamic, about what work was focused on. If it's important to the other person to be the alpha and you can do your work, do your work. Because it's the only way to adjudicate this status argument. Now, people will say, well, if I do that, then I'll always lose everything. I'll be a doormat. But that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you get to decide what your work is. And if it's important to you to win a, a Turf war. A turf war that's visual on the status thing, then go fight that fight. But all the time and energy you're putting into that fight is time and energy you're not putting into your craft. And I think it makes way more sense to say, I made this, and to be proud of that, and not worry about some metric that you didn't pick. Good stuff. What's the worst piece of advice you've ever gotten? There's a company called Learning Annex. Have you ever heard of them? Do they have them out here? Some of you have heard it's not of on my radar. Okay, so the idea was you to me, but in real life, in 1990-something. Okay. So you would go, they'd rent a school and have 20 classrooms, and at night you could take a course from this person or this person or this person. And this was early in the days of desktop publishing, and they came to me and said, will you teach the desktop publishing class? And I viewed it as, well, there's an audience, I could teach this, you made $49 a night or something. And then... They would send someone to watch what you're doing, steal it, and then have lots of people teach the class you invented. Yeah. And the advice I got from the person who brought me in was, if you really want to make it at this, it needs to be way more generic. It needs to be predictable. There needs to be an outline. There needs to be a syllabus. This is how teaching works. And start with a topic sentence, take people through the tactics, create a test, do that whole thing. And I've gotten that advice throughout my career, about my speaking. When I invented the idea of slides with no words on them, really well-meaning people said, you can't do that. Your slides need to have bullet points on them. And, yeah. and, 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 and at every step along the way, I knew at my core that if I listened to that advice, I was doomed because everyone is better at fitting in than me. And so if I'm going to play that game, I'm going to lose that game. I'd rather play a game that might be a much smaller game where I have a chance to make the impact I want. Yeah, yeah, that's good advice. Um, and it's difficult, right, to break the mold of the status quo or... Yeah, because then I got fired. <laughs> well, or, or if you say, I'm going to do it differently, you get the blame and the punishment. Yeah. Right? I mean... Or, um, can you talk about... Uh, there's probably... Raise your hand if you're a freelancer. Raise your hand if oh, you're a freelancer. Oh, there's way more freelancers than that. Than that. So let's start by defining... The difference between entrepreneurs and freelancers. Can yeah. You do that? And then give me your opinion on whether or not we should work for free sometimes. Because, Love it. Okay. You know, we get asked to do things on spec. Sure. You know, if we do agency work or if we, you know, yeah. show me first, prove the model, uh, work for free or for an intern, you know, whatever. Yeah. So the freelancer entrepreneur dichotomy came to me literally out of the blue. And I think it's one of my big contributions to the world understanding this difference. And once people hear it, it makes their lives so much better. Freelancers, we get paid when we work. We have to show up in person. That's what we get paid for. Entrepreneurs get paid when they sleep. Entrepreneurs build something bigger than themselves. Entrepreneurs often use other people's money, but always are working to build something that they could sell if they wanted to. It's not them. You got to be really clear which one you are in any given moment because you'll get confused. Here's why you'll get confused. If you're a freelancer and you think you're an entrepreneur and you try to grow, what you're going to do is hire someone to be you, someone cheaper than you, therefore not as good as you, so you can keep the vig. And what you end up doing in a jam is hiring the best available person who works for free, which is you. And so you end up working for yourself all the time, frazzled, saying you're building something big, when actually what you're doing is a workaholic freelancer. That's a bad idea. <laughs> that what freelancers ought to do if they want to grow is raise their price. Get better clients. A freelancer with better clients is happier, more productive, and more profitable than a freelancer with bad clients. But that's the work if you're a freelancer, the seeking out of better clients. How do we get better clients? You talked a lot about picking your clients. Yes. How do you do that? So the entrepreneur thing is, 
If you're an entrepreneur, your only job is to hire someone to do your job. Every time you invent a job, hire someone else to do it. If you can keep doing that, that's how you become Larry Ellison. That's how you become someone who builds an entity. Larry Ellison doesn't code at Oracle. He doesn't make sales calls at Oracle. He doesn't clean the building. What does Larry Ellison do? He just keeps inventing things for people to do and hiring them to do it, right? And so if you're an entrepreneur and you're not doing that, well, I hope you're enjoying your day because you're allowed to build a job because that's what you've done is built a job. But entrepreneurial work is that creation of the next cycle. Okay. So if you're a freelancer, how do you get better clients? The way you get better clients is by telling a true story that resonates with what better clients want to buy. So Frank Lloyd Wright famously designed Falling Water in 15 minutes on the back of a paper bag, one of the most iconic homes in the United States. And he turned to the client and he said, if you wish, I will build this for you. He didn't say, let's have a focus group and meeting and sanding off the edges and make it a fun place to live. He said, if you wish, I will build this for you. Frank Lloyd Wright had great clients. Why were his clients great clients? Because he was the Frank Lloyd Wright. And they felt like it was worth all the suffering and expense to have a famous architect because that's what they wanted to buy, a house from a famous architect. Some of them wanted his actual art, but most of them wanted to be able to say, and Frank Lloyd Wright designed it. So that's one way you get a client like that. Another way you get a client like that is, let's say you're an ad agency. There are lots of good clients who need to be able to tell their boss, we hired a firm that won a lot of awards. Or we hired a firm that used to work for our competitor, but we got them to work for us instead. There are art directors who want to hire a photographer who's extremely difficult to work with. Because if they're a diva, they must be great. And so I happen to know photographers who are divas on purpose because being a diva gets them better clients. I mean, so we go down the list. What story is this person telling themselves about this transaction we are about to have? Right. And back to the engineering mindset, if you think your job is to do your job, then what you're going to do is keep lowering your price and keep working harder. And what you're going to get are clients who don't want to pay a lot and want a freelancer who's going to work really hard. But those aren't good clients. There's just a lot of them. And that's a race to the bottom. I think it's a race to the bottom and you might win. <laughs>